Jo. Hello, everybody, and a uh, uh, wonderful uh, World Menopause Day to you, all of you that are listening to us. Today, uh, we have a special guest. Uh, you know that uh, uh, UNED Voice Lab have uh, uh, awarded with a research project under the program the Atracción de Talento de la Comunidad de Madrid to investigate female voice during this uh, period of uh, biological development from different perspectives, including impacts of uh, workability, communication, teaching, and singing. But of course, our current project built upon a previous research uh, that has been contributing to the understanding of this field. And today's guest is an honored professor uh, in Belgium that has been doing lots of research about menopause and voice. She's a professor at the Department of Rehabilitation Sciences of Ghent University and a guest professor at the Musical Department of the Brussels Royal Conservatoire. She teaches uh, several courses on voice and language at the Masters in Logopedics and Audiological Sciences and also works as a voice clinician at the gender team and the ENT department of Ghent University Hospital. And her main areas of interest within voice research are transgender voice, elite vocal performance and effectiveness of voice therapy. So I would like to welcome you, Professor Evelyn Dahesley. Uh, Dasselia, uh, sorry, uh, uh, Flemish name, difficult to pronounce, but I hope I did it well. It is an honor to have you uh, with us today. Thank you so much for accepting this invitation. And as you know, traditionally in our YouTube channel, we start our interviews by asking uh, um, the reason why you uh, became interested in research about voice and uh, science of the voice of vocology. So could you please tell us more about um, uh, how did you decide to dedicate your research to speech language pathologists? Um, and uh, among all SPL areas, what brought you a specific to voice clinic and research? Yes, well, uh, thank you uh, for the uh, introduction. It's really an honor to, to be here um, with uh, your research uh, team and uh, on this YouTube channel. Um, when I was a, a student, uh, I was particularly interested in medical sciences. Uh, I was also put in in science, um, but I loved my acting classes uh, when I was young. So actually in SLP, I really found a discipline that is combining uh, these aspects. Um, and especially in voice, you have so much diversity in voice. Uh, I find the artistic part uh, in it. Uh, it is really a discipline that combines the medical aspects um, with also a lot of yeah, artistic work. Uh, you have like the voice disorders, uh, the professional uh, voice. Uh, so I love to guide uh, also the, the professional voice users uh, behind the scenes uh, with their voice. And then of course, uh, my uh, passion about gender diversity and the diversity in voices is, is really what, um, yeah, what drives me in, uh, in this work. Uh, you have many publications on the influence of age, gender, and hormones on voice. Uh, why this particular interest, especially regarding menopause? Yes, <laughs> I understand that question because I was uh, very young when I did my PhD and uh, I, I got that question from others too. Why the menopausal voice? Um, well, actually, I was uh, very interested in the endocrinologist part of um, this work, the effect of hormones on the voice during lifetime. Um, and I, when I did some research, I found some information about vocal aging, but what I was missing in the vocal aging in, vocal aging in women uh, was the impact of the menopause on the voice. Um, there was some uh, pioneers work of uh, Abid Bol in, uh, in that time, but I was really looking uh, to the um, voice characteristics uh, and I did not found a lot of data about it. So that's why, um, yeah, the topic of my PhD was then studying the menopausal voice. 
Yeah, that we have in common, the interest on in hormones, sex steroid mm -hmm. hormones and the effects of voice, because my PhD was also on that, but uh, on younger women and the menstrual cycle and oral contraceptive pill. Mm -hmm. Actually, today I was in a seminar looking at uh, statistical replication of that uh, and would be very good if we could uh, uh, look into that and, and uh, bring that um, knowledge of statistics uh, to uh, improve our field in voice research that I think we still have lots of things to do uh, with this mm -hmm. respect. But, um, you know, according to your findings, which were the most uh, uh, common voice problems that you found uh, in relationship with the menopause? Uh, are there other problems that could indirect also affect the voice at this uh, period of a woman's lifespan? Yes, I think um, the hormonal influence is just one part, um, of course, in, in the voice. So um, I found, found in my research that the menopause is, uh, or menopause is particularly affecting the fundamental frequency, so the pitch uh, in the voice, uh, but it was not accompanied uh, by a lot of uh, voice problems in many of the of the. Um, uh, menopausal women. So it mainly affected the, the fundamental frequency, the speaking fundamental frequency. But um, it was really part of vocal aging in general, because we know with vocal aging that in women, the fundamental frequency decreases over time, and that menopause adds uh, a bit more of that, uh, of that decrease. So it's difficult to um, take the menopause the menopausal effects out of it. Um, it's really part of the general aging uh, process. Uh, yeah, we did not found. Oh. Go ahead. Go ahead. We did not found um, other um, characteristics of voice that were impacted um, of the menopause of, or by the menopause. But from what I read from the literature, the voice actually drops in pitch in women about uh, the age of 40. And uh, mm -hmm. although age should, is not a good predictor of menopause and, and should not be used as a predictor of menopause, as you know, because of these confounding effects yeah. uh, also of uh, aging and also because uh, it is so varied in women, the age of menopause anyway. Mm -hmm. but, uh, would you say that bes beha besides that drop in pitch at the age of 40 that uh, the literature has found as compared compared to females at the age of 20, the menopause increases even further that drop in pitch? Yes, because um, in our research, we found that uh, the menopause causes another, uh, an extra drop in, in uh, fundamental frequency of about 14 hertz. That is not a lot, of course, compared to the other effects of aging, but it was indeed an extra um, drop in, uh, in pitch that, uh, that we found. Um, in non-professional voice users. Um. Yeah, uh, and one thing uh, that we have been noticing here in our studies at the lab is that the extent to which menopause affects women's voice is quite individual. So menopause seems to be problematic for some women, but not to the majority of them. Do we have an experience on, uh, on to what extent are female voices affected by menopause? Yes, that was also yes, that was also my experience. So for many menopausal uh, women, um, this was not um, a big problem uh, for their voice. Um, but there is a, it is highly individual. So what we think is that um, there are differences in androgen receptors in the larynxes between individual persons. So this might have to do with the. Uh, individual differences that menopause is affecting um, uh, the, the one woman more than, than another uh, woman. So this might um, be part of the uh, explanation. Another thing that uh, we found in our research is that um, there is also an impact of endogenous production of estrogens. Uh, meaning that in, uh, especially after menopause, in the fat cells, there is a conversion of androgen hormones um, into estrogens. So this process is really important um, for the uh, hormonal balance in, uh, in women. So what we found is, was that women with a higher BMI 
um, they have other voice characteristics uh, and a lesser drop in fundamental frequency compared to women uh, with a lower BMI. So I think these um, aspects are uh, responsible for the inter-individual differences that we found uh, in, uh, between women. Uh, wonderful. And BMI meaning body mass index. So yeah. I actually, just Sorry. for those who don't know the uh, short name for it, the abbreviation. Wonderful. So, and, and uh, uh, I, I recall that you, um, before Anna uh, goes to uh, her next question, I recall that you uh, also study effects of uh, hormone replacement therapy, right? Uh, did you yes. look at it? Could you talk more about it? Uh, is it advantage, for example, uh, for a professional voice user, because I think a drop of 14 hertz is about two semitones, um, roughly. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and yeah. um, and uh, that for a, a non-professional uh, voice user uh, might not be a significant result. But for example, for a classical uh, high mm -hmm. soprano coloratura will have a huge impact because then the comfort zone in uh, the, the voice of that singer will drop, uh, meaning mm -hmm. that she might have trouble uh, keeping doing the same repertoire and she, as she did before. Um, and um, many singers report to me that uh, it's they feel like they have another, a different instrument. So would these uh, professionals benefit from using a, a hormonal replacement therapy? And uh, what are your insights about should they take it for this purpose or should they waive the effect, the side effects of it? Mm -hmm. And always, of course, look for um, uh, informed uh, um, and knowledge and advice from doctors. Uh, and, but as a researcher, what would be your opinion about hormonal replacement therapy? Mm -hmm. Yes, I completely agree that uh, the impact of menopause is different in singers and professional voice users, because what I, what I studied in my PhD was um, the menopausal voice changes in non-professional voice users. So a lot of them did not have complaints, but in my clinical experience and also from the, the new literature, it is clear that singers or uh, experience um, those small differences in voice uh, a lot more. So um, what I know from, from my experience with working with singers is they also lose their top notes um, due to menopausal uh, changes. So about uh, hormonal replacement therapy, uh, we found that um, there was no extra drop in fundamental frequency in uh, menopausal women taking hormonal replacement therapy. So this was a really important finding. Um, we did not see the drop in fundamental frequency in uh, women with a high body mass index and in women taking hormone replacement uh, therapy. Of course, um, I know that the research was only uh, performed in um, non-professional voice users, but my hypothesis is that indeed uh, the uh, hormone replacement therapy will protect in a certain way or to a certain level um, professional singers. However, I do need to stress that this is really a very personal decision of um, the singer. And it's also, it's not only about voice. Um, menopause also affects other um, health aspects. So this is something that they have to discuss with uh, together with the uh, gynecologist uh, and take um, a good informed decision. But indeed, my suggestion is that it will, to a certain level, prevent um, menopausal um, voice complaints. Uh, Thank you. And you already told us that uh, what happened with singers at menopause exactly. Um, in singers, I think um, though this is my experience that um, the speaking fundamental frequency also drops, but they also experience with vocal aging uh, more uh, vocal fatigue. 
um, sometimes they lose the top note, so it becomes a little bit more difficult to to perform their um, or sing their their songs that they are used to sing. However, it's difficult here to um, differentiate between the vocal aging process and um, the, the process of menopause that is adding um, to this process. And uh, uh, you mentioned already uh, hormonal replacement therapy as a coping strategy for those who feel the uh, differences, but do you think about other strategies that could also work uh, that uh, for those who don't want to take hormonal substitute uh, medication? Yes, I think it's important to take into account the, the vocal aging and, and the menopausal changes of, of voice during uh, in, in getting older um, and to, to prepare you for, for these changes. So I think um, uh, at, at uh, middle age, um, when you're middle aged, so around the, the age of, uh, of menopause, it's important to take into account that you have um, a longer uh, warm up, or you need a longer vocal warm up, um, so you can you can do that uh, to prepare you for your um, singing tasks. Uh, also, what we have found in uh, our research is that uh, people who sing they um, get their voice more active and they have um, other and better voice characteristics than people who don't uh, sing uh, when they are getting older. So I really should advise to um, yeah, take care of your voice and pay more attention to a longer vocal warm up, to vocal cool down, uh, doing vocal exercises, extra vocal training. And this could also uh, be a very good coping strategy for the changes that uh, um, women are experiencing during lifetime. I think our results in the future will corroborate what you just said. <laughs> oh, that would be lovely. <laughs> Uh, so, so yes, <laughs> vocal training uh, could uh, help to, to avoid problems during menopause transition, right? Especially if you start training before menopause. Mm. Yes. Yeah, that, that's also what, uh, um, what my hypothesis is. Um, and uh, what research is also showing uh, in the literature. However, it, it should be further investigated in professional singers. With, uh, so that would be something very interesting yeah. to know about in the future for sure and as uh, as an slp have you came across with many patients whose uh, voice problems were triggered by menopause well i don't see a lot of patients uh, coming in the clinic uh, with a voice problem that is solely due to menopause. Um, most of the time it's more complex and it's a combination of uh, triggers and um, um, yeah, influencing factors on the voice. So menopause is, is one aspect in the voice and could add um, in, 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 and be part of the a voice problem, but it's not the main cause of uh, of voice problems in uh, in many women. Yeah, you've been talking also about uh, the differentiation, the the, dif the differences between uh, menopause and aging. Uh, how can we differentiate? <laughs> differentiate. <laughs> It's so difficult because in, in, uh, in real life, it is just, um, it, it is combined. It is actually part of, of, uh, of the vocal aging process. But from a researcher perspective, for me, it was important to investigate like the aging, uh, the effect of vocal aging without the menopausal changes. So that uh, is also what we have done. And we saw a lot of changes in, in vocal aspects in frequency range um, in drop in fundamental frequency uh, before menopause even uh, takes place. And then uh, we also studied the effect um, of the menopause itself, uh, which indeed gave an extra drop in fundamental frequency. So, but that's from an, a researcher's perfect perspective because we were really interested in, in um, yeah, looking at the menopausal effects alone, but um, of course it's it's part of of the vocal aging process. Uh. So, you would you consider that uh, the vocal aging starts around menopause or after menopause? Because 
from a biological point of view, from a reproductive perspective, the end of reproductive life is at menopause. But nowadays, mm -hmm. a woman would live more um, 40 years after menopause or 30, let's say. And uh, um, research on aging um, is really in, um, considering geriatric uh, cases uh, further um, down in, in the age line of, of a person life that it has increased substantially. I mean, we have uh, now people that live up, up to 90 years old, up to 80 years old. And of course, should we say that an age... A, 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 a voice at the age of 50 is aged when we compare it to an, a voice that at 70s. Mm -hmm. I think uh, we are talking about different qualities, quite different qualities. And, um, and uh, also from a perspective of, I mean, the voice is a reflection of your personality and your state of mind. And many women do not uh, find the menopause as a spooky monster that uh, ends up your life. And now everything will be different from now on because many women go through menopause very naturally, like some stage of life, like I giving birth. I also gave birth and then I also was young and this is just another phase of my life and I'm not old at all. So don't you think that the, also concerned the menopause and voice, there is a stereotype that the menopause uh, inflicts aging in the voice and actually might not be aging because aging to my eyes is something completely different related to the loss of toners and, you know, geriatric voices are really, mm -hmm. really characteristic as compared to menopause voices. So should mm -hmm. we talk about aging voice at the age of 50 when we know that the population lives up to 80s and 90s years old these days. Yes, that's a very interesting uh, topic that you are uh, addressing because voice is changing during lifetime. Like we have already vocal changes at the age of 40, 50. And I agree that that um, you cannot call that vocal aging if you think in terms of, of geriatric voice, which is completely different. So it's a, it's a gradual process during lifetime. Um, I think it's particularly important to not um, say that, that it's like a disease or it's pathological uh, because it's a, re a really a natural process. Of course, when you, when you look at um, focal aging, uh, there are people who are suffering from um, uh, vocal uh, aging, uh, but it's only a very small part. Um, the other people, um, it's just in the other people, it's just an, an, um, uh, a normal process in life. So I agree with you completely that menopause, we, we should not look at it as a disease. Sometimes uh, when, when, except when you, sometimes when you read um, papers, you can, they describe it as a disease, which is in my eyes, it is not a, it's not a disease. It's a very natural thing, uh, which happens indeed uh, around the age of, uh, of 50. Um, so yeah, it, it's just a gradual process through life, um, actually voice changes and, and we have to adapt to every changes in every change in, in pitch, every change in, in vocal capacity, vocal quality. But I agree the, the vocal aging is more than, um, yeah, in the geriatric population. Mm. And, and could you summarize what are the characteristics of a, a, an aging voice? You mean then in the geriatric yes. population or? Yes, uh, yes, yes. Uh, Yes, then I think um, there you can find, like, uh, if you look at the, the larynx and, and the vocal folds, then uh, you might see a bowing um, effect, which is uh, impacting the, the power in the voice, uh, but also the, the frequency range and the intensity range uh, in the voice. Um, and of course, uh, on the other hand, it affects uh, pitch in, um, in the voice. So this is really, um, yeah, it has a bigger impact uh, on voice than uh, the other changes related to menopause. And that leads me to another question. Sorry, I'm going away a bit diverse. Okay. Let me do that because this, today is a special day. 
uh, don't you agree that the way we are looking at uh, the data on voice uh, during the menopause is a bit uh, uh, poor in the sense that we look at um, sustained vowels and fundamental frequency. And as you just said, the voice changes in intensity, the bowing effect will have effects on uh, uh, phonation types because someone with a bowing vocal folds will have a breathy phonation kind mm -hmm. of a, and, yes. and very weak in intensity, <laughs> right? So for that sense, don't you think we should look at uh, voice maps or phonetograms when we study the voice during the menopause? Because then you have how the vocal range of a person uh, changes across before mm -hmm. and after the menopause, for example, on longitudinal studies, if we <laughs> uh, are <laughs> brave enough to do them and lucky enough to have the subjects to do it, the participants, of course, the follow-up studies are very difficult to do. Um, and also voice range profiles are a really, really individual um, um, maps mm -hmm. of the voice. So comparing before and post menopause will be a bit, uh, um, uh, how I uh, say this, uh, um, a bit difficult because they are so different. So mm -hmm. uh, what would be as a researcher, your recommendations to look more thoroughly into the, how the voice changes at this period of, the, of life? Yes, I think I agree that uh, we should look at longitudinal studies, follow-up studies, because when you compare groups, it's so difficult because there are so many other factors affecting uh, the voice. And we also should look at, uh, at speech and not only at uh, sustained vowels, because in the past we worked a lot with sustained vowels, but it's not a valid way of, of looking at voice characteristics. So now we have better uh, outcome parameters to um, to measure like uh, in speech um, which is yeah, more valid uh, than than just look at uh, sustained vowels uh, yeah so i think we should have an, a complete focal map um, of the vocal capacity um, and look at vocal quality but in uh, sustained um, in in connected speech Thank you. Mauro, do you want to ask something more about functional voice training? Yes, let's go back to the training. Mm -hmm. <laughs> something that I liked. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a teacher of singing. <laughs> oh, yeah. Okay. So, uh, so uh, despite uh, you, you don't have too much experience with menopausal patients, uh, but do you have uh, some preferred exercise types to work with uh, the people who, who, who are crossing menopause and to prevent the problems or possible problems? Yes, well, uh, I like to work with uh, seam included focal tract exercises. Uh, we have also data in, the, um, in this population that um, this improves focal quality. Um, and we also have uh, a study of uh, vocal warming up exercises, um, which are a combination of several exercises, but mainly also um, semi included focal tract exercises. And when you look at literature, we there is a lot of evidence about vocal function exercises that uh, can be used to improve uh, vocal quality. Could, could you, for our listeners, explain a little bit more what is a semi occluded vocal tract exercise? <laughs> Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, like a semi-included vocal tract exercise is an exercise where you um, create an obstruction in somewhere in the in the vocal tract. Um, like for example, um, you can do it uh, uh, between the lips. Like if you do like you make like an um, an obstruction here, and what is happening? Uh, the uh, the voice, um, the acoustic signal. Um, it uh, uh, it experiences an um, uh, how do you say it um, the the narrow uh, passage. So a lot of the energy to explain it um, easily is going back to the to the vocal tract, um, and so we see that the uh, vocal cords vocal folds are um, yeah uh, moving better actually in these exercises. So we have very different kind of uh, vocal semi-occluded vocal tract exercises because you uh, 
uh, can do it um, with an, um, lip an trill? external source, lip trill, yeah. like, yeah. Bang trill. You can do that. Uh, uh, buzz. Go ahead. Yes, or you can do um, it with, with a straw phonation. Like if you have a straw, I'm just looking here around because most of the time I have straws everywhere. If you uh, phonate between a straw, like that, uh, then it's also um, uh, kind of an uh, SOVT. <laughs> yes, most of the people, they, they know them by now. Or if you um, phonate um, through an, a tube, uh, through water, it also helps um, with the uh, voice production. Uh, a glass tube, you mean? Or any um, and, uh, so a, a tube, it can be a glass one, but also a flexible uh, tube uh, can help. Um, and when you put it uh, in water, like two centimeters below, um, then and then you phonate, you, um, you, uh, you, you produce a voice. Um, you also have the massage effect of that exercise in your uh, throat. So it's really a lovely exercise uh, to do for singers uh, because it, uh, it creates that massage effect uh, extra um, and the other effects of, uh, of SOVT. Be aware of our YouTube channel because uh, near, in, near in the future, we will have an expert on this type of exercises that works mm -hmm. with the uh, injured singers. And um, that guest will be explained how she does it with her patients, but be uh, tuned <laughs> to us. Okay, Anna, go ahead. Um, I, I would like to ask you, uh, because you said uh, earlier that uh, for regular people, it's, uh, singing is, uh, is beneficial. So I would like to, to ask you how it's beneficial for everybody to sing. Yes, it is. Um, because when you uh, sing um, during lifetime, and, and especially when you get older, um, you activate your, your, uh, yeah, your muscles, your, um, uh, your voice. And uh, we have found that um, these vocal qualities in people who sing are better, and they also sound, for listeners, they sound younger. So um, if you want to keep your voice young, um, you should keep singing um, because for listeners, then you sound younger. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for ringing that uh, today. So we could do some aesthetic surgery without yes. surgery in the voice by going to singing uh, groups uh, like choir singing or other um, singing together or individual classes. So voice education in singing, it's important uh, for um, reasons of young, uh, um, making the voice younger uh, and sound younger, the voice. But also I would say because of uh, the, um, um, there is some research that uh, sheds light into the fact that singing together brings us the sensation of well-being. And there is actually physical benefits from singing together because you release uh, endorphins, your cortisol levels go low. So actually there's even research on the immune system and singing. Uh, so, and um, was astonished to, to see there will be a, a special issue in applied sciences showing how the speech voice is just a small, tiny part of the whole voice that you have. So singing explores much that of your vo uh, whole voice uh, and not just that little bit that we use for speech. And that coming from a speech and language pathologist is wonderful to hear. So thank you. <laughs> I guess actually maybe most of uh, speech language pathologists that work with uh, voice uh, started with singing or acting or, <laughs> or some artistic use of voice. <laughs> Yeah, I think um, it really helps also a uh, speech and language pathologist uh, to work with, uh, with voice and experience the, the diversity in the voice because um, that's also something that actors and singers can uh, do like the best is, is showing the diversity in, uh, in voice. Uh, yeah, they're really playing with, with the sound and uh, I think SLPs can learn a lot from, uh, from singers and actors. And we also learn a lot from SLPs. 
especially in methodological approaches to work uh, um, in voice training because um, it's really good uh, to communicate and, and merge the fields that are not that um, apart at all. They, are, uh, they have very many common things. Anna, I think you want to ask something else. I can see it from your face. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I think we already talked about that, but um, I would like to connect uh, something that we already said that uh, that we said. We use the term uh, to sound more uh, young or younger. And I think this is kind of an error to uh, maybe we should uh, use that uh, to sound uh, healthy <laughs> or more more healthy because um, we are talking about menopause and uh, I think uh, one of those problems about menopause is that everybody uh, associates menopause with uh, being older and socially uh, this is not a good <laughs> Uh, so, uh, what is your opinion about, about this absence of uh, menopause in, in scientific uh, research and uh, why is this happens? Why, why menopause is not there? Why we don't, you know? <laughs> Talk more about it and research yes. more about it. In, and um, yeah, and the research that has done focus on the voice uh, and uh, of female voices, especially. Mm -hmm. Yeah, what I think is, is important is that um, in voice research, you um, should uh, take the menopausal changes into account. And um, what we have seen a lot is that um, in, in voice studies, um, menopause is not questioned. So um, they don't take into account these uh, menopausal changes. So I agree that in the future, uh, this should be highlighted more in uh, research studying, um, the, especially the female voice, um, so that they should um, take into account the hormonal aspects of, uh, of voice in general. And then, of course, we need more studies um, investigating uh, menopause uh, and menopausal changes. Yeah, maybe we should uh, write an article saying, you know, like the guidelines to research you know, there's guidelines to use microphones and uh, measure SPL and all that. But uh, mm -hmm. as to concern the, the female voice, they should write in papers which part of the cycle they were in or whether they were passing through yeah. menopause or where <laughs> they were, yeah. you know, reference to pregnancy normally there is, but nothing more than that. So maybe yeah. we need more information in future papers about female voice. Yes, I completely agree because we it, it's not only menopause. It's during lifetime, we have many fluctuations in, in hormonal uh, aspects. Uh, like there is very, very little information about pregnancy on the voice. And uh, in singers, they uh, mention that it affects their, their voice. Of course, you have the, the physical aspects and, and um, the the breathing patterns that can be different, especially in, in the late phase, but there are also hormonal fluctuations that can um, yeah, have an impact on the voice. So there's a menstrual cycle, you have that, like uh, pregnancies, there's menopausal changes, there, there are yeah, a lot of hormonal fluctuations during lifetime that we should take into account in, um, in doing research. Um, and Anna, I especially liked it when you say don't talk about a younger voice, because actually uh, you're absolutely right. These are um, uh, things that listeners sometimes attribute to voices. And what is also important in, in research is that uh, we look at voice from um, a different um, perspective, uh, more from a, a biocultural perspective. Uh, model of studying voice and so not only studying the vocal characteristics uh, but also take into account cultural aspects because these are are different and, and aspects of listeners uh, that attribute some characteristics old young to to voices um, and really look at at um, voice identity uh, which can be different in, uh, in each individual so I think in in our field we yeah, have to change our approach uh, in general um, of looking at, uh, at voices. Wonderful. As, as uh, 
you have studied many other topics, of course, <laughs> uh, such as gender and voice uh, and aging. We we're talking about it. And one thing that we also like to ask is, what was the most striking find uh, finding for you with respect to voice and how it functions, how, how voice functions? Yeah. Yes, for me, what strikes me the most is uh, actually related to my work with uh, gender diverse people and transgender people, how they are able uh, by practicing a lot to change their voice that eventually matches their gender identity is for me um, amazing what, what they do. So, for example, uh, a trans woman who is able to feminize the voice uh, so that the voice matches more the gender identity. Uh, these are sometimes amazing changes which requires a lot of exercise and effort to be able to do that in daily speech. Um, so that is really what, what amazed me the most um, of, of what they are able to do. And I'm only there to help them find their, their voice identity. Um, and, and the work is what, what they do. So that's actually what strikes me the most uh, in my work. And speaking about transgender women, uh, do you find that uh, they always need surgery in order to feminize their voice or the work with the speech and language pathologist, uh, Logoped, will help them um, to make them feel confident with the identity of their voice and how it matches the gender? No, it only, um, uh, it's not for every trans, not every uh, trans woman needs an, uh, an SLP uh, for changing the voice. I think what is really important is that, um, yeah, we accept differences in, in voices. And what for me is important is that the person um, is, is happy with the voice uh, themselves. Uh, so, you have trans women who do not need vocal voice care. However, a lot of um, trans women do need voice care and suffer from their, their voice because uh, they do not like their voice as, as um, it, it sounds. Um, and then indeed, um, yeah, the SLPs can help them finding their voice. Uh, and especially um, not everyone needs uh, voice surgery. Uh, I think there are women, uh, trans women, who uh, prefer voice surgery because of a lot of personal factors, and that's fine. But I think most of them benefit from an, um, for, from vocal exercises. Wonderful. And talking about the future, uh, what is one of the research questions that you have in your mind, burning questions that would like to see answered? Well, actually, I'm very curious about the mechanisms behind the hormonal voice changes. Uh, so about the uh, receptors, estrogen, androgen reception, receptors that are or are not present in the different layers of the vocal folds and how they then affect the physiology in the, um, in, in the vocal folds and eventually affects the uh, voice characteristics. So I think... Uh, a lot of research need to be uh, done there. Uh, also, it will be important for us to understand um, uh, the, the vocal changes that uh, are happening. And it will also be important for transgender research, like understanding the voice changes in, the, for example, the trans men taking hormonal therapy, gender affirm, affirming hormonal therapy, how voices changes there also depends on androgen uh, receptors and um, how sensitive a person is for, for hormones, because that's also highly individual. Mm -hmm. yeah, uh, I think also for, for singing this, uh, all the, the research that is been, has been doing on transgender voice, it's important because if a person can change completely their characteristics for speaking voice, they, can, they could do that for singing voice as well. Yes, indeed, we need to, uh, to do a lot of more research about that because we also like to inform singers about the, what will happen if, um, for example, they take testosterone on their uh, voice. We know, of course, that uh, the voice is 
lowering and vocal range is changing, but it's especially important for, for singers uh, what is going to happen with the singing voice. And you have the same in, in trans women, um, yeah, for the singing voice. Especially also uh, concerning uh, hormonal related medication, like for example, um, if you take oral contraceptive pills, I mean, mm -hmm. the study that I've done was a double blind randomized placebo controlled trial, but only on one uh, oral contraceptive pill. But as you know, the progestogen component of oral contraceptive pills is quite different. And uh, depending on that, will have different mm -hmm. effects on the body. So they, um, for example, if a singer needs to take hormonal contraception, then there is not a lot of literature saying uh, which one is most uh, uh, indicated uh, uh, for, for example, singers or for teachers, or uh, which will not have the same requirements at all. But still, they rely on the quality of their voices. And we know how the quality of the voice in a teacher affects also learning outcomes in the students. And, um, and also, um, uh, um, research, of course, concerning the hormonal replacement therapy, because there is so many in the market Mm -hmm. that you can choose for and the doctors will go for the best for that patient but if that patient uses a voice professional and uh, relies on the quality of the voice as a tool of trade then needs more information than the the one is available right now and the majority of gynecologists i talk with they do not know that there is such mm -hmm. an effect of uh, you know the reproductive uh, um, organ is uh, well uh, um, sex steroid hormones impact so much uh, on on voice quality and the extent to which they impact it's still not clear uh, also concerning what you said that is still a debate ongoing how many receptors we have although the, mm -hmm. the study by Kirgis and et al in 2017 yeah. was quite a good one i think yeah. that maybe we need to replicate those studies and and go deeper and uh, and see even by studying other equally uh, target uh, hormonal target tissues that we have in the body, like the skin, for example, or um, any other organs that we have that re respond to sex tail hormones. Maybe we will learn more from yeah. that. So thanks yes, for a lot. <laughs> a lot of research that needs to be done uh, in the future yeah well yeah. Uh, we are on it and we are quite young so we have a look at <laughs> for the <That's> future <laughs> you have a lot of time to research these uh, topics yeah yes Evelyn thank you so much for your um, in, you know your um, knowledge and sharing this knowledge with us today in this special day that we celebrate World Menopause Day it was a pleasure, really. <laughs> um, thank you. Thank you thank very you much. Thank you for having me. Thank you very much. Uh, and as Filippa said, keep on tracking <laughs> our YouTube channel and uh, social media. We return with many other special guests. <laughs> okay. Thank you. And bye bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Thank you.